if there is a competitive devaluation in Asian currencies and they are backed by the dollar in the sense that uh, these Asian central banks have dollar reserves, uh, right? So there's probably going to be a rush towards dollars. That doesn't mean that that gold and silver prices are going to go down much because there's a there's a, a rush to gold and silver now among at least the at least the banks or the financial players, not necessarily the public yet. Um, so I would expect the dollar to strengthen and uh, relative to those currencies and gold and silver to strengthen relative to the dollar, uh, which is what we've been seeing. Right. If if you look at uh, at least over you know a longer term, uh, it was five or ten years. I didn't. I haven't looked at the chart in a while. But if you look at the dollar index versus gold and silver, the dollar index is doing pretty well. What is it like 106, 107? I don't even remember the number. But that's historically pretty high compared to you know what it's been since 2005, 2006. Rafi Faba, a renowned financial analyst and commentator. Faber's expertise in precious metals, particularly gold and silver, provides us with a unique perspective on the global economic landscape, especially in times of financial instability. So, sit back and relax as we explore Faber's views on currency devaluation in Asia, the role of precious metals, and the potential future of global monetary systems. Rafi Faber starts by addressing the potential devaluation of currencies in Asia. He speculates that if such devaluations occur, a significant response might be an increased demand for silver. This is because silver, being a global commodity, would see its price rise in all currencies if there's a financial crisis spreading across several countries, not just isolated ones like Thailand. Faber highlights that in scenarios where multiple Asian economies, including giants like China and Japan, experience financial turmoil, there could be a rush towards tangible assets like silver. Faber discusses the strength of the US dollar relative to other currencies and its implications for gold and silver prices. He explains that Asian central banks holding dollar reserves would likely rush towards the dollar in times of currency devaluation. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that gold and silver prices will drop significantly. Instead, he predicts that both metals will strengthen relative to the dollar. Faber points out that over the past five to 10 years, gold and silver have maintained their value well despite the dollar's strength suggesting a robust demand for these metals among financial players, if not yet the general public. Delving into historical context, Faber explains that before 1873, the dollar was backed by both gold and silver. Post 1873, it became strictly a gold derivative, which he argues is unjust. He envisions a future where we might return to a system of free market money, backed 100% by gold and silver. Faber anticipates a significant upheaval where central banks might lose their power and people would gravitate towards physical assets to protect their wealth. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more expert insights and analysis. Guessing, I mean, I, I, won't, I haven't been able to do full research on this, but if there is a devaluation of currencies in Asia and their response is to buy silver, then silver is a global commodity. It'll go up in all currencies. Uh, it, it, so uh, that, that's that's what I'm thinking. I can't confirm that, uh, but why else would it go up? If if there's a financial crisis somewhere, not just in one country like Thailand, that Thailand's not big enough, but if it spreads to Russia and in, in Asia and China and Japan, and then they're all demanding more silver because they're getting nervous, whether it's banks or, or traders, uh, demanding contracts or derivatives of silver or you know I, I would guess that the physical demand was kind of low but some kind of something of silver then uh, you know the price would go up uh, if the, if the currency is in trouble if there is a competitive devaluation in Asian currencies and they are backed by the dollar in the sense that uh, these Asian central banks have dollar reserves uh, right so there's probably going to be a rush towards dollars that doesn't mean that that gold and silver prices are going to go down much because there's a there's a, a rush to gold and silver now among at least the at least the banks or the financial players not necessarily the public yet um so i would expect the dollar to strengthen and uh, relative to those currencies and gold and silver to strengthen relative to the dollar uh which is what we've been seeing right if if you look at uh, at least over you know a longer term uh, it was five or ten years I didn't I haven't looked at the chart in a while but if you look at the dollar index versus gold and silver the dollar index is doing pretty well what is it like 106 107 I don't remember the number 
but that's historically pretty high compared to you know what it's been since 2005 2006 so we have a, we have a stronger dollar relative to other currencies and we have gold and silver uh, gold at record highs and silver at uh, you know levels that it's not at very often at all <laughs> So uh, we'll just ki- we'll continue to see that, right? We'll continue to see the dollar strengthening relative to other currencies, but the metal is not really caring and just going up anyway. While gold is the money and the rest are derivatives of it uh, in one in one way or another. Um, this is what I, I try to clarify. I try to get people to think in, in, to these, in these terms um, that the, the main gold derivative is the dollar. It used to be a silver slash gold derivative before 1873. Now it's strictly a gold derivative. Which is itself is unjust and suggests that the end game is not going to be us going back on a gold standard. It's going to be us going back on free market money of a silver currency and a gold currency that's 100% back. That's how I see it, and uh, I see all the central banks being kicked out and and laughed off, or, or you know maybe something violent happens. I don't know, but I think people are going to be pretty upset. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's 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 not going to be good for them. Most of them are invested in these assets, in stocks uh, and tech stocks and whatever it is. They, they, they log into their brokerage accounts on Interactive Brokers or TD Ameritrade and they see a dollar number there and they imagine how much wealth they could purchase with that stuff, with, the, with those dollars that they say that their, their, their brokerage accounts are worth. So why would anyone care what the price of gold and silver are if they're doing fine? Right? They really start panicking or getting or at least before they panic, they get interested in gold and silver. When when is that? When their stocks aren't doing so well right? and their brokerage accounts are a lot less than they thought they would be. And, and then they suddenly realize they're like, well, gold and silver are heading higher and inflation is what they call inflation. Right? Rising consumer prices are getting worse. And these gold bugs are suddenly they're they're increasing their purchasing power. Maybe I should look at that. There's no reason for them to even look at it. If, let's say, gold was $400 an ounce and the Dow was instead of 40000 400000 they still wouldn't look at it. That's has to do with the ratio. And if you look at the ratio of, of silver or gold to the to stocks, stocks are still doing much better than, than gold since, of course, since very much since 2011. But even recently, it's still very, very low. Um, <clears throat> that's why this um, the panic will really come – all at once, as it did in the not all at once on the same day, but it'll come like a snowball. And uh, once once the Dow to gold ratio or the S and P to gold ratio, whatever ratio you want to choose, once gold really starts outperforming, um, and it, it, incidentally it has been outperforming since 1971. If you look at a chart of gold versus versus stocks versus the Dow, since 1971 gold is outperforming, um, but not not since. Um, since 2011, the last 12, 13 years. Once that changes, you'll get a change. Uh, you'll get a change of uh, of heart from from the the public, the investing public. Um, but it's not going to happen until stocks really start struggling, or inflation eats into the value of their portfolios to such a degree that it doesn't even matter that stocks are rising. We have retail. Um, I assume you mean retail demand in the wet in the West, and premiums are low. Um, well, you know, stocks are doing well. So people are looking, people with enough money to buy gold and silver with, they're looking at their brokerage accounts and they're saying, oh, this is fine. I don't have to protect myself. So demand is low. Uh, and uh, I'd say the, the, the metals are being drained from the big uh, centers, from the big stocks center, metal stock centers. Why is that? Um, it could be, um, you know, big hedge funds. Uh, not hedge funds; they don't they don't invest in physical, but but big big banks, um, you know, uh, getting calling in warrants and putting them into eligible and taking them off for sale. Maybe they want to store them for a while and uh, sell them later at a bigger profit. But in the East, um, I know China's stock market has been doing very poorly, and uh, you know I wish I knew what was going on there. I'd have to go visit, but I don't really want to go <laughs> because China scares me. So uh, I would assume that the public there is a little bit more wary of of, um, of false prosperity now that their their brokerage accounts have been going down. So they also have a um, a stronger tradition uh, with physical metals than Americans do. We haven't had you know big uh, gold culture since 
I don't know, the 1920s, 1930s when FDR took it all. <clears throat> so um, that's my guess as to the the three prongs of this strange market. But it's all going to come together in the end and everyone's going to want physical, whether you're a bank or an individual or in the East or the West. It's Right now it's, you know, it's morphing and you have this blob going up in different directions. But at some point it's going to become resonant. And, uh, you know, like singing in a shower, it's going to bounce off itself and these waves are going to start matching. And then you're going to have a glorious sound of gold and silver bugs all abandoning all currencies at the same time. Faber notes that the general public tends to ignore gold and silver when their stock investments are performing well. It's only when stocks struggle or inflation severely impacts their portfolios that they start paying attention to precious metals. He explains that historically, since 1971, Gold has outperformed stocks, although not consistently. The real shift in public interest, he predicts, will come when stocks perform poorly, leading people to seek the stability of gold and silver. Faber highlights the differences in demand for physical metals between the East and the West. In the West, the demand is low because stocks are performing well and people feel financially secure. However, in the East, particularly in China, where the stock market has been underperforming, there is a stronger tradition of holding physical metals. He attributes this to a historical and cultural familiarity with gold and silver, unlike in the West, where such a tradition waned after the 1930s. Faber concludes that eventually, both banks and individuals will turn to physical metals. He likens the current market dynamics to a resonant frequency that will eventually harmonize, leading to a unified rush towards gold and silver. This shift, he believes, will reveal the true value of these metals as more people abandon fiat currencies. Uh, that's how I try to boil it down all the time, that this is all theft. And the, the objective of modern economics since, especially since Keynes, but even before that, right, since post uh, Adam Smith, is really how can we manipulate the monetary system, just steal just the right amount of money that we can make our society look richer than it is when we're really borrowing from the future by stealing from everybody. And, uh, and all the academic jargon around messing with the money supply and interest rates and this and that is really goes to that question, like how long can we fool people into thinking they're richer before they figure it out? And then everyone gets surprised when everyone finally figures it out and they realize that they're poor, that we have a crash. And then people are like, well, how did that happen? Well, the, the natural consequence of stealing from somebody else is that the, the society is poorer because when it comes down to it, the most basic sense, either you're going to trade and you're both going to get richer on exchange or, so, or one person is going to steal from another person and then that person is going to have less at the expense of the other guy and, you're, and, and society is going to be poorer on, on, um, on balance because the guy who gets stolen from is going to stop making stuff. And then there's going to be nothing for the other guy to steal if you just take it down to a society of two people. Either you're going to trade or you're going to steal from each other. If you steal from each other, you're both going to starve. If you trade, you're going to get richer. But th that's basically it. And everything else is just circling around that logic and making it academically palatable for the intellectual bodyguard of the Hohenzollern, as Rothbard puts it. Faber criticizes modern economics for creating illusions of wealth through monetary manipulation. He argues that the fundamental issue lies in borrowing from the future to make the present seem richer, leading to inevitable crashes when people realize the true state of the economy. He believes that the current system's reliance on manipulating the money supply and interest rates is unsustainable and that a significant correction is imminent. Discussing monetary aggregates, Faber admits to the complexity and confusion surrounding their calculation post-COVID. He recounts how the late economist Bob Wenzel used to predict stock performance based on money supply growth rates. However, since the pandemic, traditional methods have become less reliable due to unprecedented monetary policies and overhangs, such as reverse repos. Faber is convinced that the current economic trajectory is unsustainable. Despite not being able to pinpoint an exact time frame, he stresses that economic principles of scarcity and choice will eventually prevail. He warns against remaining in the financial casino, suggesting that a significant economic shift is unavoidable. Make a confession, the, the monetary aggregates have been so confusing to me since, since COVID 
You know, I uh, I was taught by um, by Bob Wenzel of Economic Policy Journal, the late Bob Wenzel. He passed away in May 2021, and he would calculate the monetary aggregates in terms of the quarterly annualized money supply growth rate. And if it was high, then he would say stocks are doing going to do well. And if it was low, he'd say stocks are going to crash soon. And he was generally right. Um, but since COVID, you know, we just it just went vertical, and now we have this overhang. So how do you calculate it? And uh, we have we still have about five hundred billion dollars left in the reverse repos that are supposed to still, uh, you know, filter into the money supply at some point. Uh, so I'm really at a loss as to how to calculate the money supply anymore and how it would affect stocks. But it, look, it's some, I do know that it's not growing. Right? It's not growing anymore since 2021. The question is how much more debt can can be piled on. Uh, to keep the uh, the aggregates going up and up and, uh, or up high enough to keep stocks elevated, uh, but I, look, I know that at some point soon it's going to stop because this can't this can't go on uh, in in terms of uh, nailing it down to a time frame. I've been trying to do that since COVID and it hasn't worked, uh, so I'm just going to stay out of the casino because at this point I don't get it and it's going to end. At some point, because economics is the study of scarcity and choice, and people can't all be rich at the same time, especially when the government is spending so much resources on blowing things up.